heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we have got the latest on the health of the banking system and, of course, the state of fundraising. We're joined by some key VCs from Viet Ventures and Costa Noa Ventures. Plus Coinbase weighing the United Arab Emirates for its international hub. We hear from Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong on what's driving that decision. And we'll have the latest on Meta. As of the social media giant may end Facebook and Instagram news content in Canada. And as the company vows to fight back against the FTC over children's data. And as we dwell on that story around a publicly traded company, let's go more broadly across the indices right now. Because some caution in today's trading, even though we've got a lift in European trading and Asian trading, today we just pull back a little bit in the Nasdaq off. Well, six points were basically flat on the day coming off of our lows we're really though seeing some pressure on the bond market this is we not more fo focus on the fed but we actually focus on supply on corporate b bonds being sold ultimately and a whole heft of them we're expecting some 35 billion dollars towards the rest of the week so we're up by five basis points as we see a supply pressure coming two-year yield currently creeping up to 3.96 percent and i'm looking at the vix just dialing back a little bit so even though we see this cautious trading volatility is low we're still well below that 20 handle at 17 move it on Let's look at what's happening in the world of crypto, because we have seen volatility there, no surprise in many ways. We're off by 3.5%. We're going to dig in, Ed, to what the stories around Binance, around some of the ability to be able to trade the OG in the crypto space. Interestingly, some new meme coins coming onto that particular, well, ecosystem, basically, and it's clogging up, Ed. Yeah, two halts in the 24-hour period or 12-hour period on Binance. The operational update is that Binance says those pending Bitcoin tra transactions were processed. Bottom of this board, you see crypto-related stocks in the equity space also moving to the downside, very closely linked to that story. Up here, Zscaler, 21% gain, biggest jump since September, at one point on track for its biggest jump since the end of December 2020. There's a lot of feel-good in the cyberspace after its prelim results came in far above expectations. If you see energy in the cybersecurity space. That is why regional banks, again, a story. We're seeing a rebound, particularly in PacWest, following on from what we saw on Friday. You know, we were also asking ourselves again, Caroline, what is the rationale here? There's been a lot of fighting talk from PacWest about its operational health. I remind myself for this program, Bloomberg Technology, that when it was founded in 1999, it was with a remit to serve venture-backed companies. Really important for our audience because many of them have some sort of banking service, even with these regional banks. Yeah, it is important to think about also the more broad risk-taking that people do and don't want to do as we're still slightly cautious around the ultimate safety of the banking system. Let's talk about PacWest and so much more with our one and only Shanali Basak. And Shanali, it feels as though anxiety levels dialed back a little bit today, but through any fundamental reason here? Listen, the, these stocks have sold off pretty dramatically. And if you look through Friday evening, we had a lot of tenuous news. For example, Fitch placing PacWest on a negative ratings watch. But to the point that you're making fundamental reasons, it's not because of the deposit base they did that, and it's not because of the holdings, the bond holdings that have hurt so many of these banks. The reason they put them on a negative watch is because they're worried about the strategic direction moving forward. There are stories last week about potential strategic asset sales. What is the business model of PacWest moving forward? I would also note, to Ed's point here, that a few of these banks that are still under pressure, not you know, beyond First Republic, PacWest. Western Alliance has been the worst performer on the KBW Bank Index here. Uh, a lot of banks that are based out west. And what is it about these firms that really bring these deposit base and the risks tied to the lending all together that have investors spooked at this moment? Shanali, if there's anything that the market's cheering, it seems to be a dividend cut. Why is that such a significant factor with this stock. It's interesting because typically when you see a dividend cut, you don't see investors reacting positively. But in this instance, the reason that there might be a little bit of relief is because investors are looking to pack West to do everything it can to keep its capital base strong. And that means some tough decisions in the meantime. It doesn't need to be the case that these banks fall into deeper and deeper concern after we've seen such big issues already. But again, there's, there are longer term worries here, Ed, and you really see it reflected in 
in the bond prices of Western Alliance and PacWest, which have their bonds trading, the ones maturing in 2031, trading at 60 or 40 cents on the dollar still. When I talk to investors on the sidelines as well, there's a hesitancy to get in until some of these existential questions are cleared up. Bloomberg Shanali Basak out in New York. Thank you. Let's stick with the story and bring in Fiat Ventures managing partner Marcos Fernandez. Marcos, I, what is uniquely relevant to the VC community that you're a part of and venture back startups in this scenario with the regional banks? Why are you paying such close attention? Absolutely. So banks like First Republic, like Silicon Valley Bank and PacWest, uh, as was mentioned, they cater towards the venture community, both venture capital funds and the founders that we back, the startup community as a whole. And it's not just the deposits that they hold, but it's venture debt solutions that help them expand out their runways. For those founders in particular, it's loans that help them be able to do things like purchase homes when a lot of their value is tied up in private equity. So we pay a, a big attention to it, certainly, and, and work very closely with our founders to help them seek alternatives, especially as markets continue to be more volatile. This is the biggest two-day jump in PacWest on record. But from your perspective, I guess you're not lying awake, awake at night thinking about that. I mean, w what is the ongoing consideration for VCs like you and your portfolio companies? Yeah, so unlike Silicon Valley Bank, which sprung about really quickly, you know, the news broke on a Thursday, and even going into the weekend, we didn't have certainty the Fed did a great job this time by coming out first thing Monday morning, making sure that there was both certainty around the deposits as well as a suitor. So it really did help us sleep a little bit better at night. And also for a lot of the startups that we've been working with, we've been helping them seek alternatives over the last several weeks as this continues to unfold. So the short answer is no, we, we haven't lost too much sleep behind it. What I will say is there's phenomenal people at the PacWest banks of the world as First Republic and Silicon Valley banks. And so I think mostly we, we want to make sure that we're good to our partners at those institutions as well. You know, Caroline, I, the reason I ask those questions is that if you're a startup founder or a VC, you're kind of uniquely not liquid, right? Think about all of your net worth that's tied up in, in the equity valuation of your, your private company. The other thing we've learned is that now you're, if you're a founder, you've got to find options. You've got to diversify. You've got to modernize your banking. And maybe start tapping fintechs, other solutions, ones that don't actually have a banking license but certainly have an offering. And this is where, Marcos, your experience comes so into play. You've backed the likes of Brex personally over the years. You, you're someone who's worked at other fintechs, SoFi, as well as, well, in the crypto ecosystem. Tell us about fintech, whether this is a moment for it to outperform or whether actually there's more worry around more newer entrants. Absolutely, Caroline. I, I hate to say that my glass is always half full, but in this case, one of the early winners is certainly fintechs. So you mentioned Brex, others like Mercury Bank. They have seen a lot of influx of deposits for two really big reasons. First is they've built tech stacks on top of legacy infrastructure, which helps them onboard and open up more accounts more easily. And then second is they work with multiple financial institutions and banking partners. So not only does that allow for them to see more diversity behind those deposits, it allows them to extend out the federal protections that fall within that for their consumers. Now, while a lot of companies and, and individuals have gone back towards these pillar banks, the Wells Fargo, B of A's, JP Morgan's, during these uncertain times, it's also exposed a lot of the inefficiencies behind these institutions that rely on a lot of individuals' time and processes to be able to open up accounts. So again, this is just another issue and, and instance of why fintech and a lot of digitization behind traditional financial services is so important. What do you want to see built at this moment? When you are so uniquely focused on fintech, on the future of fintech, on backing new startups and founders and visionaries, what is the problem you want most sorted at the moment? Absolutely. So I think the first wave of financial technology innovation, people focused on direct-to-consumer businesses. We think of the SoFi's, the Chimes, the money lines of the world. But the next wave is certainly much more embedded. So in some cases, you actually won't know that there's a fintech at play behind these traditional institutions that you're bringing your money to and your deposits to. And that's really important because over time, every company under the sun has some sort of financial aspect with their business. And so that next wave is really going to be led by those that are building the picks and shovels and infrastructure that allow both large traditional financial service firms to, to become more efficient, but also those in adjacent industries like healthcare, mobility, climate, future of work. And that's what gets us really excited. When I hear picks and shovels, I immediately start to think of those who are saying, talking about the mining ed of crypto in particular. Yes. And Ed, just fold in, I suppose, that on a day where we really keep an eye on what's happening in crypto, there's, there's the read across with, of course, Marcus having worked over at Ripple for a while. 
Yeah, I think if you're going to draw some commonality between what we're talking about, I guess it's the want for decentralized systems, but also uh, the same cycle we went through in crypto we saw play out in banking to a certain extent. I mean, Marcos, thread those two together for us. When, when you uh, are, are looking at what's happened in the banking sector, the hype and boom cycle as well around what happened with crypto, do you sort of have the same systemic concerns that apply to both? In some cases, you see a lot of correlation between the two, right? It's individuals get really excited about the potentials of a technology, but it takes time for that to become something that we can adopt over a large scale. Fintech, for example, a lot of neobanks came in and got people excited. But during these, this market volatility, we're seeing them go back to these traditional pillar banks. Same thing with crypto, right? The idea of decentralized systems is still really exciting. It has a ton of use cases and applications. But it takes time to build that underlying infrastructure at a scale where millions and hundreds of millions of global individuals can actually take advantage of that. So certainly there's correlations behind the two. But what I'd say is it's not to use a sports metaphor, but we're not just in the early innings. Like, I don't even know if we've started the game yet for both fintech and for cryptocurrencies, because there's so much potential to be had here. And we're finally seeing a market where people can go back to building the fundamentals behind it. So building out the, the businesses that will help us scale to those hundreds of millions of consumers, both in the U.S. and on global markets. Um, that leads us very smoothly on to our next conversation. We thank you for that, Fiat Ventures Managing Partner, Marcos Fernandez. Great to have some time with you, Ed. Yeah, look, we're going to keep the crypto conversation going. Coming up, we're going to hear from Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong and where the company's looking to establish its international hub and sticking with crypto. I just want to check in really quickly on Bitcoin and where we're trading right now. What we saw is this fall further away from 30,000 US dollars per token. We're at 27,878 right now, but we've also fallen below the 50 day moving average. The story of the last 24 hours was Binance halting more than once transactions relating to Bitcoin. Those transactions have now started up again, but there were high volumes and some fee issues on the blockchain that impacted the biggest token. This is Bloomberg. Crypto exchange Coinbase is weighing the United Arab Emirates for its international hub. CEO Brian Armstrong says the UAE is leading the way regionally in crypto. He spoke to Bloomberg at the Dubai FinTech Summit earlier. Have a listen. Coinbase, our mission is to increase economic freedom in the world. So that means we really need to do that in many, many countries. Obviously, we started in the U.S. and took a very compliance-focused approach and became a listed company there, and that's been a big piece of our revenue still. But we've increasingly expanded into other major markets around the world. Now what we're doing is we're looking for a home to set up an international hub that could serve the long tail of countries in the world, you know, the Middle East, Africa, maybe parts of Asia as well. And from that point of view, the UAE is very attractive. I mean, the UAE deserves a ton of credit. They're the first country in the world I'm aware of that created a, a dedicated new regulator to crypto, and they've published a clear rule book, and it's very business forward and, and protecting of consumers. But are they ahead by a country mile here relative to the UK and relative to the US? Well, I would say they are ahead of where the U.S. is. Um, you know, the, the EU has actually published comprehensive yep. crypto legislation already. The U.K. is on their way there. But I would say uh, the UAE, is their approach has been more forward thinking than the U.S. so far. So we spoke to your CFO. You're the CEO. The Wells Notice. Everybody, you know, is sort of digging around for news here. And I sat down and thought, what is this Wells Notice? Is it an Armageddon moment potentially for Coinbase in the United States of America? I think this moment is really an opportunity for us to finally get some regulatory clarity in the United States. Um, and we're happy to do that, by the way. It's, I think it's a great role for us to play in the industry and for America. You're going head to head with the SEC. Well, that's true. I mean, look, we don't relish the opportunity to be in litigation with one of our primary regulators. We've sought out regulation all over the world and tried to be proactive when there wasn't clarity. But if there's no clear rule book in the U.S., mm -hmm. we created our own best practices to evaluate you know, over 1,000 assets, and we rejected 80% of them. The, the 200 or the 20% that we list, are, we believe, are commodities. And there's been no clear rule book. And so if we receive a Wells notice, I feel like we have a duty to take a push back and go seek case law that will help bring this clarity to the U.S. I mean, I fiddled around with this question for about two hours. SEC, <laughs> CFTC, what is the question you asked the CEO? And here is the question. <laughs> Are these regulators still fit for purpose? <laughs> well, 
I think there's certainly a role, yes, because crypto is many things. Crypto is has caught commodities. Crypto has some that are securities. We don't list them, but there are some out there. Yeah. We think there should be a robust, healthy market for that. There's also stable coins, which are more like currencies. There's artwork, you know, with NFTs. And so crypto is going to have a number of different regulators. It probably is going to need new legislation to be passed in the U.S. And the good news is in, there's broad bipartisan support in Congress for that exactly to happen. Can you see a day where you go, look, troop side, I'm gone from the U.S.? We're not going to leave the U.S. Um, you know, we do have a choice of where to invest our dollars around yeah. the world in any given moment, but we're not going to leave the U.S. It's an important market, and the good thing about the U.S. is there's rule of law, and so we we do reach the right outcome eventually. <laughs> Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong with her own Manus cranny, Caroline. One and only Manus. Meanwhile, let's stick with crypto a little bit more. You referenced it earlier, Ed, the Binance situation, how it's restarted withdrawals of Bitcoin itself after citing congestion on the tokens blockchain after two halts in less than 12 hours. The suspensions had weighed on the cryptocurrency markets more broadly, it seems like. We can go to our own Katie Lines out there in Washington to just discuss what are these new meme coins that are getting on, what is the, the original of the cryptosphere before we sort of associate NFTs, meme coins with Ethereum, but why are we now associating it with Bitcoin? Well, you can trace it back to the new Ordinos Ordinals protocol that was introduced earlier this year, Caroline, which, as you are alluding to, allowed now non-fungible tokens, meme coins, to be minted on the Bitcoin network, which primarily they usually were just based on Ethereum. The fact that they have now uh, come to be part of this network, this ecosystem, has, mean, has meant that it is more congested, congested, and as a result, fees have gone higher as well. And Binance says that is really what the problem was here, that this wasn't, as was speculated earlier about people pulling money from their exchange, that this really was just a congestion problem. And as a result, to address this, to make sure that it doesn't happen again, they have uh, raised uh, fees to make sure all of those pending transactions actually uh, will be mined by Bitcoin miners. But that's ultimately what it comes down to here. STZ, uh, the CEO of Binance, saying that some of those fees are up 18 times over just the last month that we've seen more and more activity taking place on this blockchain. I think the, the data point that caught my eye from the Bloomberg reporting is that with $5 billion worth of transactions happened in that 24-hour period from a volume perspective, it makes you realize yeah. that Bitcoin is kind of everything from a volume perspective, right? That it was the, the, the volume of transactions trying to ram through that caused all of this. Yeah, that's exactly right. Again, a congestion problem. But you are speaking to the kind of volume that Binance is seeing here. This is also why this exchange in particular is so critical in terms of driving sentiment for the broader ecosystem, because it is by far the largest in the world, especially after the collapse of FTX. So really, people look to Binance as kind of a bellwether for what is happening in the wider system. So the, the amount of activity there when they do see disruptions like this is reason why you start to see some uh, market participants getting concerned. But yeah, it, it's a great point, Ed. When we are talking about the broader crypto ecosystem, of course, Bitcoin really is the, the not monolith, but really just the dominant uh, cryptocurrency in this ecosystem. Maybe all of these meme coins that are now clogging things up are really just kind of a distraction at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, before we dive into the world of Pepe and some of the other um, exuberant rising coins that are basically like, what, a couple of cents or dollars and suddenly yeah. rise ever higher. Talk to us a little bit more about the international focus. We had had anxiety around Binance. What more about just more broadly global interaction with crypto at the moment? We're still seeing desire to be trading here in the US, whether it's over there in certain parts of Asia. What happens in China at the moment? Because I mean, what is it it's still with thinking about how China is interacting with crypto more broadly? Well, especially as China, it seems like is looking to kind of build up Hong Kong as another center for this activity. And it really comes down to the differences in the regulatory environment, right, Caroline? I mean, when you're looking at Binance in particular, in theory, Binance U.S. is supposed to operate uh, independently in its kind of own silo. But we know that the CFTC earlier this spring sued Binance for violating U.S. derivatives rules. It's been under a lot of regulatory scrutiny here in the U.S. And the same goes uh, for other players as well. We were just hearing how Coinbase wants to have a wider footprint uh, internationally because at the end of the day, these regulations, uh, what activities people can actually engage on do differ uh, country by country. So that is a huge factor in here. And I would note as well, in part of this uh, regulatory landscape, what has happened with the bankings here in the U.S. is when the liquidity picture comes into the conversation. I've had a lot of guests on Bloomberg Crypto in recent weeks and months talking about 
how liquidity really is just so thin, and that exacerbates the price moves to the upside, sure, which is what got us north of 30000 but also to the downside, which we're obviously seeing play out in really broad-based selling in crypto today. Bloomberg's Katie Lyons out in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Now, coming up, China's Baidu, known for its line of smart home devices, is adding a new product to its AI-operated roster and entering an already crowded arena. Talking tech coming up. Carrot. Yeah, another key story we've got to keep covering is, we'll see, Ed. Shares of the company over in Asia trading had absolutely rocketed more than 7%. We'll talk about why perhaps we're seeing some more optimism coming from the leader of that business. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Time for Talking Tech. First up, China limiting access by foreign entities to its data after a series of reports published by U.S. researcher firms spooked government officials. This according to the Wall Street Journal. The move is expected to make it harder to analyze what's going on inside China as tensions between Beijing and Washington mount. Speaking of China, Chinese tech firm Baidu is entering the mobile phone market, adding a smartphone to its portfolio of gadgets, similar to the likes of Amazon's Alexa division. The device will be unveiled next week and will utilize its artificial intelligence software. Plus C, the Tencent Bank Southeast Asia internet company boosting pay for most of its workers this summer. Workers who joined on or before March 31st will get a 5% salary bump. CEO Forrest Lee says the company has reached, quote, self-sufficiency after taking dramatic measures to slash costs. Caroline. Yeah, what a different tack from a few months ago for that particular company. Meanwhile, well, coming up, we've got to dive into what's happening to Meta today. International stories abound, a vow to fight back against here in the U.S., the FTC as it faces some pretty stiff reviews of its privacy policies. We'll also be discussing what it's doing about Canada too. Let's just check in on how the shares are moving. Let's check in on how more broadly the tech market is moving. Meta actually managing to hold up about, we're down a tenth of a percent. That's in line with the rest of the market. There's caution out there. Some big tech heavyweights are just dragging some of the indices a little bit lower today after what had been a lot of exuberance following a few of their earnings. From New York and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Carol, let's go to check on the market. Let's be honest, there's not a huge <laughs> amount of energy in financial markets this Monday morning. Look at the NASDAQ 100. We are completely flat, although some slight wood downward pressure across the majority of names. Outperformance slightly in the SOX, although modest, up to tenths of 1%. It's interesting to note that a lot of the AI-related chip names, your AMDs and NVIDIAs, actually as well as Alphabet, are moving to the upside during Monday's session. Some movement in bonds are up five basis points on the U.S. 10-year, 3.49, at 1.3.5%. And then kind of risk off when it comes to crypto. We've talked about that story all throughout the show, the pause on the Binance platform in terms of Bitcoin transaction. But that has had an impact. We're below 28,000 U.S. dollars per token. Some individual movers that are interesting, Zscaler really outperforming and actually carrying a number of cybersecurity stocks with it. It posted prelim results far ahead of expectations, kind of puts to rest this idea that spending on cybersecurity was under question. Alphabet, as I pointed out, an AI-related name, up 1.5%. And then to the downside, you see Microsoft and Meta actually has paired some of its losses, but those were two big point drags on the major indices. And let's dig into one of them. I mean, point drags lower, we've got volumes thin, but there is a lot of news to digest when it comes to Meta at the moment. In particular, let's talk about it here in the United States, as the company really fights back, saying it's going to oppose an FTC plan to look at banning it from profiting off of children's data. For more, we want to bring in Bloomberg's Emily Birnbaum. And the backstory to this is what the FTC is really analyzing some mistakes made in the messenger 
part of the offering to children, but trying to sort of read that across to a broader implication for how they make money from children more broadly. Yeah, so the FTC is looking back to an agreement that they came to with Meta in 2020. Um, so alongside a $5 billion civil penalty, which is record breaking in the agency's history, um, they had Meta agree to a series of privacy pledges. And they say that uh, Facebook has not adhered to the promises that it made. And that gives them the right to go back, revise that agreement that they came to with Facebook in 2020, and put all these new standards and these new um, processes in place for ensuring that they are actually pr protecting the privacy of U.S. users. Emily, what's Meta's arguments in all of this? Meta says that the agency is vastly overstepping on its authorities, um, that they are trying to um, take a mechanism that the agency does have, which is uh, revising old uh, agreements, and they are going too far in, you know, uh, banning them from monetizing children's data, um, putting all these new restrictions that would force them to submit to privacy reviews before they launch any new products. They say this is too sweeping. They intend to fight it in court um, and that it shows the FTC is biased against Meta. All right, Bloomberg's Emily Birnbaum out in D.C. Thank you. Let's stick with this story for more Meta and bring in Diana Moss, president and CEO of the American Antitrust Institute. Dan, how much does this test the boundaries of the FTC's ability to shape privacy policy, but through enforcement? I think that's a great question. I, I think we're seeing right now a, a, a real tension between the FTC's mandate to promote consumer protection, but also uh, to promote competition. They've had a bit of a rough go on some of the competition cases involving big tech. And, and of course, now we see uh, the moves on, on privacy. But I think the important thing to remember here is that user data is the fuel, the gasoline that, that powers the digital platforms. And collecting that data, harnessing the value of it through AI and machine learning is really core to the value proposition of of attracting users and locking them into a particular platform. Diana, you heard what Emily had to say about Meta's arguments in this dispute. Do you think that Meta fighting the FTC on this will bring them success, that this is an example where actually pushing back will, will fall in Meta's favor? I, I actually don't. You know, I think what we're seeing here is a natural evolution, sort of a, a growing recognition that um, uh, the FTC alone cannot, through its authorities, address both the competition and the privacy issues. And, and as I just said, they're both integrally related. Using data, potentially abusing data, is, is the way to recognize or realize that value proposition. I think what we're seeing are, are, is going to be a series of violations of, uh, and pushback, because that is the value proposition. You're talking about very strong incentives uh, for the digital platforms to use and potentially abuse data uh, to uh, to realize that value proposition. And and I think what, where we might be going is the need for a broader system of regulation in the United States, much like in the UK, both on competition issues, but on privacy issues as well. And you referenced the UK there. What about more broad regulation, just more globally, a more joined up approach? Well, I, I, I think that's where, where it's going. Uh, the problem is we have a lot of jurisdictions and we don't have any sort of international authorities, but there is a tremendous amount of cross-fertilization and, and collaboration on, on international uh, regulatory approaches. And I think the other thing to realize here is what's going on with Meta and the data in this particular case is going to be no different than other platforms' use of data to, uh, to power uh, the e-commerce and the social media platforms and uh, advertising on their platforms. So a regulatory infrastructure would address not only these concerns with Meta, but also other digital platforms uh, that are very powerful. And to be fair, I mean, Meta has already limited kind of information that informs certain ads, particularly when it relates to teens on its apps. They've, they withdrew the ability for advertisers in particular to sort of target teens on their interest in their activities. You basically only know location data and an age. 
but they're going to have quite a PR feat on their hands because anything saying, no, 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 we need to be able to make money by advertising directly to children, how, how do they manage to have, make that nuance with your years and decades of experience in this? Can companies make a case for themselves that this is in line with, you know, ultimately what's good for the company, but also not detrimental to society more broadly? I think that's a hard line to walk, given how integral data collection and uh, data processing and harnessing the value that data is for the digitals. And I, I, I think the U.S. is getting to a point where the, the comfort level uh, in accepting promises and reassurances from the companies about how they will not misuse data, it's, it's beginning to wear thin. And, and what we see here with the FTC uh, to their credit, is, is, is a strong enforcement action, but it's really a, this case-by-case -case approach when this problem is so systemic amongst the digital platforms use uh, and potential abuse of data that that warrants a broader uh, regulatory system uh, like we see elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in the world. Meanwhile, Meta called the FTC's latest proceeding a political stunt. Diana Moss, we thank you so much, President and CEO of the American Antitrust Institute. And in fact, it's another focus on the day with Meta. The company saying, well, it might end news content on Facebook and Instagram over in Canada. Now, that's if lawmakers pass a bill requiring social networking platforms to pay media publishers to feature their work. Meta describes the bill as fundamentally flawed, but supporters say it addresses a market imbalance as Look, more people turn to digital platforms for news ed, something that we think about on the daily. Yep, coming up, how startups can keep up with big tech in the AI arms race. That's next with Costanoa Ventures partner Martina Lauchenko, who gives us her view of the landscape. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> This is a global story that caught my eye. Japanese firm F MUFG planning to start two debt funds alongside tech lender Liquidity Capital. The funds will be established under a joint venture, Mars Growth Capital, and provide as much as $400 million in financing for middle and later stage startups in Japan and Europe. The move is the latest by Japan's biggest banks to ramp up startup finance, where they increasingly see potential for new business, Caroline. Fascinating, given the timing, Ed. And look, it's all as big tech companies like Microsoft, like Google, dominate the conversation surrounding investments in artificial intelligence. But look, VCs there too, they're flagging how startups can perhaps so get lost on the battlefield. Here's oh, what some of our recent guests are saying about the AI ecosystem. We are in the middle of an incredible revolution in AI. I would say there's many more bad AI startups than good startups. Uh, and it's very hard to differentiate if you're not experienced with AI. If you're a company today and you're not embracing the changes that are taking place with AI, you're gonna be behind. Let's take actions to help form it safely. I think it's too early to regulate uh, AI. We don't know enough about it. I think the companies that are building this recognize that regulation is needed. There's so much to get into with our next guest, Martina Lauchenko, of course, of Kustanoa Ventures. And I'm interested, Martina, in, well, the viewpoints there around regulation are thick and fast, but ultimately about how you sort the wheat from the chaff. You heard that from Vinod Kosler saying there's far more bad AI startups out there than there are good. How do you discern which ones are good on the marketplace right now? Well, at Costa Noa, we invest in really early stage startups. And so at that point, you really have to assess the founder and the fundamentals of their idea. And they, we are absolutely seeing this wave of companies that we call generative AI native, where they are clearly built on top of generative AI from the start. And you recognize it immediately. So just in the last two weeks, I saw two startups, same category. One was more like the AI remodel, or it was glamped on, and the other was clearly built on top of the large language models and the generative AI that everybody was talking about on your show. And you no immediately notice the difference just in how they're built, what the interface is like, and how they talk about what their product vision is. So there is a distinction, and that's absolutely what early stage venture capitalists are looking to invest in now. Martina, it was interesting last week, suddenly 
the open source versus walled garden conversation came into bear, particularly around artificial intelligence. What are you seeing in terms of who's going to eat whose lunch? Because it felt as though certain over at Google are saying, look, really, it's open source. It's, it's no one owning a particular large language model that's going to ultimately win out here. Well, I think you need both. I think both feed each other. The vibrancy of the ecosystem requires the open source side of the house where everyone can contribute. But the wild garden aspect is, the thing about generative AI is you have to be an expert to recognize when it's going off of the rails and how to put in place the guardrails to make it safe so that when it's used anywhere else, it makes sense. And it tends to need to be more purpose-built for a company or for what it's being used for, for it to do its job well. And that's where you might need a combination of built on top of the open source foundation, but the wild garden making it more purpose-built and intentional for whatever its purpose is. Let's take an example from your portfolio, Quizlet. How long has that been in your portfolio? It's been in our portfolio for almost eight years. Almost eight years, okay. Yeah. And so to Caroline's point, you know, Vino Costa's point, everyone is now trying to discern what is, it, what is a viable AI-related or AI-adjacent company and what is not. How has your thinking changed from when you first made that Quizlet investment almost eight years ago to when you're confronted with a deck right now? So... Costano has been around for about 10 years, and the way we have always looked at AI, AI has been around for quite some time, and it's really about what is the infrastructure that enables AI, and you need large sums of data, and you also need great machine learning, you need great machine learning algorithms, and so it's companies that have been around for some time that have the data set that let them build and train those models so that at this point in time, they can actually provide that level of AI that everyone's experiencing. So a company like Quizlet's a great example. They have a monstrous data set, the largest user-generated data set of learning tools in the world, and they've been training this data for years, and so now they're able to use that on behalf of users and creating this generative AI approach to how, what people are expecting. In this environment, where does the balance of power lie? With the VCs or the AI-driven founders? I think it's always a partnership. I think with the best VC firms, it's always going to be the founders have great ideas. They have wonderful talents that they're bringing to bear. But when the VC is really genuinely additive and a great partner, it only makes them better. So our startups, uh, our founders tend to be technical, either product or engineering based. And so they need more of that go to market partner. That's what we spend time with them on because you need the Steve Jobs to the Steve Wozniak combination. And if they don't bring it, then who backs them actually needs to help them with that. So that's what we focus on. Carol Caroline, irrespective of, of the application or where in the data prep, deep learning, inference part of the cycle you lay. I think everyone agrees on one thing, which is we need to have some parameters and some regulation in place. And whether it's self-regulation or whether it's coming from the government. Martina, to that point, are you on the optimistic front and are you, are you nervous about how quickly we're advancing without formal guardrails in place? Well, I'm both. I'm super optimistic and I'm also nervous. I don't think the government has a good idea of what they can do to help regulate this. And so I really think it's going to be incumbent on companies themselves to be responsible in how they're taking advantage of this technology and putting in place those guardrails. I mentioned before, we're, we're going to have sort of a before times and an after times of the, so those generative AI native companies, or at least in how they think, and that they are putting in place those guardrails that you don't have to be an expert to recognize that it's going off the rails. And that's going to have to come from the companies themselves. The government's not going to be able to regulate that. Thanks to Martina Lachenko, partner, of course, with Costano Ventures. The, the thing that caught my eye, Caroline, over the weekend, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger hold court during the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. On Saturday, of course, they talked about things you'd expect, like Apple and Elon Musk. And guess what else? AI. And, and Charlie Munger's like, well, I'm skeptical and Warren Buffett comes out with what, what was a pretty profound statement of the yeah. parallels of what we're seeing in AI and human history. What was it, an, an atom bomb? He 
referenced. Yes. I mean, extraordinary language. Amazement, he also seemed to demonstrate when it came to ChatGPT, other AI tools, what they're already doing, how they're already upending things. But ultimately, it feels as though he said, what was it? He compared it to splitting of the atom as potentially dangerous advance in technology. And that's it's interesting the way we just had Martina articulate that. Yes, I'm optimistic, but I'm also nervous about really the advances, the swift nature of it, and how it's going to upend basically every industry, particularly when, you know, there is Charlie yes. Munger and Warren Buffett sat in the middle of energy industry, of banking industry, of all sorts that are going to be upended by AI. Yeah, one, one thing I would point out is, you know, is it relates to Elon Musk. He was very praising of Elon Musk mm. and Tesla and entrepreneurialism. But he said, you know, for them, Berkshire Hathaway, they need certainty and visibility on returns. And in the field of AI or whatever Elon's doing with Tesla and Twitter, that's not the sort of certainty and visibility that they're going to get. Yeah, and some tough talk for the banks, of course, as well. So much to dissect from one Warren Buffett. <laughs> Meanwhile, coming up, we'll have a look at, well, how Apple's doing. Look, there's a lot of debt sales going on. We're kicking off the week strong. Apple's decision to raise $5 billion. It's a US blue chip bond market today, it feels like. Were you searching for safety there? This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Apple selling debt in the U.S. blue chip bond market. Borrowers flooding in, looking to raise cash before two key pieces of data later in the week, Caroline, CPI, PPI. But this is something that Apple does annually, right? And you think, for me, shareholder returns. They use those funds for buybacks and dividends. Yeah, this is all often what happens after earnings. We saw it with Meta already tapping the bond market. They come out, they decide that they're going to be raising funds and look, diversify the way in which that they have money to hand. But it does feel, though, that maybe we're gravitating towards the safer areas of the credit markets. I was just looking at how the Dish chairman, of course, a company that's slightly under more pressure at the moment, is saying that the debt market really isn't open to us at the moment with these financial worries, with the macro headwind that is upon us. No wonder the big juggernauts like Apple, like Meta, yes. with a lot of cash on their hands, are able to sell and sell easily, but not for everyone, it would feel like. Yeah, look, $5 billion in up to five parts, according to a Bloomberg source. At the long end, 30-year bond could yield 135 basis points over comparable treasuries. So that's what we're waiting on. Yeah, why we saw a bit of a sell-off in the bond market more generally today in terms of U.S. treasuries. But let's focus in on the Apple part of all of this right now, because... <laughs> After its earnings, we did hear it's turning its attention really to what feels like emerging markets right now to get their growth. Mark Gurman, pleased to say that after the calm of the earnings storm, you join us to really digest from L.A. And it seems like India is front and center. It is all about international growth right now. I've never heard Apple talk about emerging markets in India, Indonesia, the UAE more than they did on the earnings call last week. And it's pretty clear why. These messages that they talk about on these earnings calls, they're very carefully crafted. Uh, they're very deliberate in what they say and they don't say. We're about to enter our third quarter, or I should say we're in our third quarter where Apple is likely to announce its third annual revenue decline in a row. It's very clear that they've plateaued, at least for now, in the U.S., uh, the larger Americas, Europe, Asia, China specifically. And so investors in Wall Street, they want to see where's the future growth. So Apple has a new pitch for them, like you said. It's emerging markets, right? They talked about yes. how this was one of the best quarters ever for emerging markets. They talked about how they have very low market share in India and other low emerging markets, like Mexico, like Brazil, like Indonesia. And that might be bad on the surface, but the reality is that, me that means there's big untapped markets for Apple to grow into, right? They make, you know, between 15 and, billion, and $20 billion per quarter uh, in China, right? Imagine if Apple could find another market, maybe it's India, where they can add another $5, 10000000000 billion per quarter just in that one country, right? That's a massive opportunity, and over time, if they are able to tap into these emerging markets properly, if people decide to buy their products, if they make key new devices and services geared towards those markets, it's very possible mm. that Apple revenue could grow exponentially just from those new regions. Meanwhile, some exponential growth of your own writing. The power on is on the Discord. Now we understand Mark Gurman. Brilliant to have you on to discuss all things Apple. It's a great story. You've got to go and read it on his daily, weekly power on. Meanwhile, 
Well, look, Ed, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology today. Recap, don't forget the podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and of course, Bloomberg platforms. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.